<laughs> Smooth, spicy, touch of orange there, crunch of the seeds from the fig. It is altogether very good. I tell you what, next Thanksgiving, I'm going to serve this for my family. Mm. In fact, I might serve it to them before Thanksgiving. Okay. Thank you so much for being with me. May God bless you and uh, keep you and make all of your lovely efforts on behalf of people that you adore, you know, come off like that does. Success. Isn't that nice? God bless. See you next time. Welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen. It's really two programs in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a program about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colorful. Maximize the flavor. OK, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimize the risk. So welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. Welcome back once again. Now this is that wonderful opportunity of us to get our heads together and see whether we can get something which is really going to minimize risk, and get some flavor going. And, uh, and this one is a sauce actually. It's a great sauce and it's actually somewhat like the great sauces that you can get from Europe and all over the world. Um, but this one um, is important, you know, because it deals with a flavor that everybody loves. Now let's see whether that's true. Do you love French onion soup? Mm -hmm. That thing with the crusted with the cheese. Well, we'll clear the cheese off for the moment and just summon up that flavor once again. OK, now that's a really popular flavor. That's important with a, um, uh, something like this. Now, you see, here is a piece of food. It doesn't matter what it is, but that's a piece of food like that. Now, it's very important when you put a sauce over the top of a piece of food like that, that it doesn't actually fight the food that you're serving it with, and, and quite a few sauces do. So what I love to try and do in this day is to bring a sauce around to get underneath the dish, to get up underneath the food and make something more of it, especially when I'm not using a lot of fat and a lot of salt and a lot of sugar, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do today, create an onion sauce, marvelously carameled onion sauce, and then show you what to do when you've got, you know, Thanksgiving and a load of turkey afterwards. And a great dish to do with that. Lots of comfort. All right, come through. Right, I need to get on with this because, you see, the first thing that I would do in this case is to take just a little oil and put it into a hot pan and start the process going. Now, um, what I've done here, just to show you what it looks like, the oil that I use is a little olive oil. And, by the way, that is different from the normal olive oil. This one has been deodorized, so you don't get that full, pungent, extra virgin olive oil thing, which I love and which, you know, Gourmets all over the world just extol. But in this case, I just want something which is right down in terms of flavor for those of you who are not into that kind of thing. So ah, this little charming little fellow here is sesame. Oh, that's toasted sesame oil. And what I do is I put in about one sixteenth part of toasted sesame oil. And now I know Trina's going to say to me, stir with a knife and stir up strife. Um, it's one of those things in our family. Um, and that then has that toasted sesame uh, taste, and it's wonderful. Now, I'm just going to put a quarter of a teaspoon full of that. It's almost as if you're saying, like, why bother? 
And, well, it's a signature item, and you can, because it's complexity. When you reduce fats, you have to come up with things that are genuinely tier upon tier upon tier of flavours and colours and textures, and it's wonderful. OK, so we drop that down. Small sizzle as it... There we are. You can hear it? Good. Um, as it hits the pan, and just stir it all around just to be able to get those onions just going fine. Now... There is a seed, uh, a couple of seeds, which can go wonderfully well in this. Now, here's a seed on, on this side. Those little seeds are called caraway seeds, and these are dill. Now, I wonder whether you can see the difference between the two. They are really quite different. They've got different functions that they play in flavor. But that little seed there is the dill seed. It's a wonderful seed, and of course, it comes from dill, and it's dried, and, uh, and they, they last forever, well, more or less. And here is a caraway seed. It sort of looks like a little tiny dried banana. Right? And those go into this. I don't want to waste anything. Um, but I take one teaspoonful each of that. Now, those put into the onions, they again, they get underneath the sauce and they come up through it. And the flavors are extraordinary. And the moment that you start to fry in those and, and it hits the pan, you, you experiment, get down... Get down close to it, and it starts to come up and get you, okay? Onions are interesting things. I've just used an ordinary yellow onion, just so that everybody can do this. But here's a Walla Walla. Um, by the time these come up, everybody goes crazy, because this is in the state of Washington, the United States, and these are wonderful sweet onions, and just add that extra sweetness to this dish, which are great. But as I said, I've done this with a regular one. The Walla Walla, when it's dried, out of season, looks like that. And this one is a Texas 1015, which means on the 10th month, on the 15th day, they plant it. And that's a nice sweet onion as well. And there's a Maui and a Vidalia, which comes from Georgia. Um, I've tried to find out whether in England, whether we have sweet uh, onions, and apparently we don't. So I know I'm going to get 3,000 letters telling me, of course we do, old chap, you know. But anyway, send it in if you want to. Always interested in hearing. Okay, now, when that's frying, um, it fries for about five to ten minutes. And I'm being sort of elastic about that. It depends how hot you do it. But on a medium-high heat, you can get some idea about how dark that can get down. See, that, that's before and that's after. So it gives you some idea about how dark it can be. All right, so that's doing there. That smell of, of, the, of the seeds are coming up brilliantly in that as well. To be able to get the... Um, texture off the bottom of the pan and into this dish is an interesting job. We do it with two things. One, which is a cup full here, that's a cup measure, of beef stock and also a cup of red wine. Now, if you're not into the red wine thing, I use the alkalized stuff just in case. But if you're not into that, you could double up on the beef stock. It'll show a difference, frankly, but I don't think it'll be a bad idea at all. So, just if, you know, you feel like that. And if you say, ah, that just the moment you've got to the beef stock, I can't go with you because it's too complicated. Get a can of beef stock, get um, some thyme, peppercorns, and a few pieces of clove and a bay leaf and some parsley, and nice herbs, and put them in a little mesh ball if you like or just chuck them straight into the saucepan and just brew it up for about 10 minutes. It just makes all the difference in the world. It's a very quick way of doing stock, okay? And, whoops, I normally pour in the red wine first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Eight um, ounces. That's one cup, you see. Now, see the color of that? That's why the red wine is such a good idea, because the color mixes with a color which has now come off the bottom of the pan take all the advantage of every residue because that's where the flavors of the onion combined with the seeds together and have drawn out this wonderful flavor. So just get it all off the bottom. And here now is one cup of that beef stock with just that little extra herbal touch to it. And um, build the heat up underneath that and get that bubbling and nice and hot. Okay, good. Well, this is going well. well you see how simple it is? Very simple idea. Okay. This is the standard way that I thicken things. Um, as you might know, this is the arrowroot deal. Arrowroot, um, in this case, has got about one and a half to two tablespoons full of arrowroot. 
Normally, if you've got a cup, eight ounces of fluid, you put one tablespoonful for eight ounces, and, uh, and that thickens it nicely. Um, in this case, I put just a little bit more. I've got just a little bit more. I've got almost two tablespoons full of that, uh, of that mixture going together. Okay. Now, because this is straightforward starch, it means that the moment that it hits a, a hot pan, it immediately clenches up. So if you've got a real um, heat underneath that one that I have here at the moment, it's sort of brewing up nicely. Um, if you will do that, what will actually take place is little you know, dumplings will form off the bottom of the pan. That's not what we want. So you move that off the pan base there and just stir it in. Now, you'll notice that this is the starch before it cooks. The starch before it cooks is that milkiness that it has to it. But now as it's absorbing, you can put it back onto the heat again. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's remarkable. I mean, just look at it. it you see, it, it doesn't need to boil to thicken. It is just so soft. And when the milkiness goes out of it, the colour comes into it. And look at, look at the colour that's in that. It's just delightful. Now, because it's so brilliant, and because the arrowroot is so glossy, you could actually leave it just like that and just serve it. But I've got an idea that if you want a smooth sauce, if you don't want sort of all the bits of onion all over it, um, then what you can do is you simply slosh, just, well, I'll just show you a little bit of this, just slosh a little of it into a blender, all right? And um, put the lid on the top and just give it uh, at high speed, just run it for about, oh, I don't know, 30 seconds. I haven't really timed it to be sure. And then take a cup of, in this case, I've gone to the absolute apex of gastronomy, is a turkey, a hot turkey sandwich. This is bread underneath and then, you know, the turkey on the top. Um, all right. Now, in this case, you simply take a spoonful of it and dress whatever you're serving on the top, like so. And it's thick, but it isn't, you know, that thick. It, do, it doesn't mask in terms of flavor. It has a wonderful appearance. Mmm, tastes good too. And this one then, if you want to get it really thin, thank you, uh, you then pour this. But look what happens. When you, when you do it with this, it's a very nice, thick, glutinous kind of sauce, but it loses some of its um, uh, sparkle, doesn't it? And because the sparkle comes from the lights hitting this with the arrowroot. But what you've actually done, you've taken the white of the onion and whizzed it into that and kind of, I think, lost it a little bit. I put a little parsley on the top of that if I was going to serve it like that. But I'm just really wanting to test the sauce itself, just the sauce. So there's the basic technique, simple one, isn't it? Just put it together and great dishes can be supported from underneath. Really, the interesting thing is that this can make a tremendous amount of difference when it comes to numbers. So, <laughs> I've never really sat down to a piece of turkey rather than a sauce like that, but it's the sauce that I'm really getting at at the present moment. Okay, get back to the taste of that in a moment. See, that is the, the glory of a sauce which comes under something and lifts it up. By the way, thanks for letting me know about screwing up the paper. I will draw on the other side later. All right, um, now... This, these are the numbers, and this is how it works. Uh, the first one here, uh, 180 calories, in, in the Minimax one, actually just gets to be 84. Right? And then we get to the fat, which is just one only gram of fat as against 13. Saturated fat is absolutely zero. And that gives me about a 10% um, of, of uh, fat from calories, and, and that's really good. Uh, cholesterol is down to 12, and in this case is zero, and then sodium is 20, and then just a couple of grams of fiber at the end. So that really works out very well indeed. So it's just a question of the taste, as it normally should be. Now, here the darkness is there, the quality is there. Ah. Mm. It's amazing. How sweet that is. That is a sweet thing. And it rolls over the taste. It's got that slight smokiness which you get from sort of 
cooking for quite a while, and I can really taste the caraway seed in it. It's really good. That, that works well. Okay? So that is something that you could use for... I, I, I imagine you're into it already. Now, I'll show you a very interesting idea. When you've had Thanksgiving or Christmas, something like that, you've got a turkey left over and ham, right? And mound of potatoes, and it's steaming hot and gorgeous. Come along. Nearly lost my glasses for a moment. Okay, now here is the sauce. It's, it's on the go from uh, just a little while before. I've took out such a lot of it, but I think just stay nice and cool and or hot, and we'll deal with you. All right, now let's say that we've got uh, the typical Thanksgiving turkey sliced into it, piece of ham on the side, and it, that, you know it's the day after and you're wondering what to do with the leftovers. Well, this is one of the things that you can get to. And let me show you, first of all, um, what it looks like in terms of meat size, because I know that not everybody has a pair of weighing scales. If you go to the deli, now uh, I'm just simply taking us to the place that if it isn't Thanksgiving, Christmas, and you want to do this anyway, so go to the deli, and ask them to slice it real thin. I mean, so thin that you can read the other slice, you could drape it over a newspaper and read the newspaper through it. Uh, so it's that thin. So you can get two slices of ham and perhaps a whole slice of turkey. Uh, is it going to see where I am? Ah, ooh. And another piece of turkey, and that would give me about three and a half ounces of meat altogether. All right? So there's the portion. That's the portion size. Very thin slices. If you're doing it yourself at home, I'm no doubt it could be thicker than that. So what you do is get a little bit of oil, just a tiny drop of oil, and um, if you've got cereal bowls, cereal bowls normally contain about eight ounces. So uh, get a little bit of oil into the bottom there and, and measure it with a measuring cup. Just pour it into the top, make sure that it works. And then take a, a slice of ham and drape it in on the side until it sort of half covers the bottom. Then take the other, there's the piece of, of uh, turkey there, and fill up that side. Then you can just sort of chuck it in at will. Uh, there we go. It's a nice portion. I don't think, actually, I, th I have a sense. I couldn't see the other side of the weighing scale, but I have a sense that it was just a little over. So I want to keep it to three and a half ounces. All quite low fat and very lean ham. OK. So there it is, over the top. Now, this is a russet potato, quite an ordinary one here. Um, about eight russet potatoes gives you about three and a half pounds. And um, can you time me for a moment? Anyone got a, a stopwatch? Ready? Go. Okay. Um, I, I need to be timed. I'm not out for a world record. I'm out to make a point here um, about, about peeling potatoes. <laughs> I was in the army once and had to do this sort of thing just because I was who I was. Matter of fact, what I did, I said to the sergeant on, on the line, you know, um, I said to him, what's that? He was holding a a little yellow piece of material on the end of a, uh, a, a sort of spoon. It was about to serve me with it. And he said, yours is not to reason why, yours is to eat up. And so I took it and I shaved a piece off it and sent it to the Ministry of Food, this is in England, uh, and asked them for an analysis about what this was because I was interested. And uh, two weeks later, the commanding officer sent for me and said, did you send this to the Ministry of Food? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, you're, for your information, it is Yorkshire pudding, and you have two weeks confined to barrack. March out. And so that was my first time of, ha of getting KP and having to do, you know, the work. How, how long did that one take? Minute. Hey, one minute? One minute. One minute. OK, now, here's the point. It's one minute of personal KP labor. Do you want to do that? I don't know but where you're coming from. But you can get powdered potato and you can short circuit all of that and get to it immediately. The only difficulty is that I find with powdered potato that it's kind of floury. For me, it isn't the same as fresh potato. So, one minute, you've got eight, eight minutes to peel the potatoes as against sort of uh, opening the package and going for it. So, it's your choice. Uh, into uh, warm water, one eighth teaspoonful of salt, bring it to the boil, and cook it for just 10 minutes. Now, after 10 minutes, which is how long this has had, just strain them out through a colander, and then, I think I've gone crazy, um, then what you do is just pour it right back in again. 
And when they're completely dry, they've got enough moisture locked up in those potatoes. It's amazing, actually, um, how, just how much there is. And for 10 minutes longer, you put it on a low heat and put a towel on the top, and they steam out. And so what um, was a waterlogged piece of potato is now perfectly cooked, and that has a sort of floweriness on the outside, you see? Now, that is perfectly cooked potato. Believe it or not, chefs in London actually um, get to have to go through a test to see whether they're going to work in a famous hotel. They have to cook boiled potatoes and make them come out just perfectly like that. All right, so put that into a, a mixer and just run it slowly. And I've got here about um, half a cup of buttermilk. And you, you know, some potatoes are drier than others or wetter than others, and you're going to have to sort of work that through yourself. So then about one-eighth of a teaspoonful of additional salt onto the top, um, some freshly ground white pepper, which is really just black pepper with the overcoat knocked off it. Um, but this way, it doesn't look like it's, you know, somebody's mended the roof on the top. And just simply curl it round like so. And then this is, a, this is an intriguing idea. This is a nutmeg shaver, because it's hard to grate nutmeg. And there are little shaves of nutmeg going down there. Not too much. You don't want it too nutmeggy, but just enough. But again, about a quarter of a teaspoonful would be fine. All right, so that is all whipped up, and it starts to sort of... Uh, um, combined together, very low speed, all right? Good. And now, just take some of this, and this can be hot or, in this case, of course, it's cold. But you take a spoonful of it, and if you're doing it hot, then it's, it's quite easy to do. Uh, just simply dash it in on top there, and smooth it out so that it comes not quite to the lip, all right? And then just move the little bits of um, the extraneous pieces of ham and turkey back from the outside. Um, then the way that I like to do this is to put, if for a family, is to put foil on the top of it, stick it in the oven, and just heat it up. Right? Then everybody gets it nice and hot. Put a, a plate on the top. <laughs> this is the time when you pray. And just... Um, Put a knife underneath, and it should all... <laughs> I said this is the time you should pray. And it all comes out and looks absolutely marvellous, doesn't it? A nice mound of, of the meat over the top. And then with that spoon... Where's the spoon? Uh, you just make a depression on the top there so as to hold some of this. When it comes out, it's hot. It's gorgeous. Then um, take the sauce that you've made and simply pop the sauce over the top like that so that it runs like lava flows down the outside. And then a little bit of, uh, of parsley uh, rain down on top, all over. In fact, when you're doing dishes like that, just overdo it a little bit more. Throw a little parsley around the plate as well, and it looks great. Great. Good. All right, now, you see, you remember that technique here? They are now on this low heat, steaming through. It's really hot, steaming towel. You could use it to shave afterwards. Just comfortable food. All right, now there is the dish. Let's see how this compares with the sort of thing that I did earlier on. It's that famous hot turkey sandwich. Um, so there it is on the dish. Now, look at it for a start. It's glistening as it glistened before. It's got nice texture to it. Looks pleasant on the plate. This one is the standard with whipped potatoes on the side or bread underneath it and slices of turkey and that cream turkey sauce. Let's compare the numbers and show you just what this looks like. Okay, um, believe it or not, the thing that we have used so much in the past um, is 893 calories for that, that size there. And in our case, we've dropped that to 422, virtually cutting the calories in half. 22 grams of fat drops to 3 grams of fat. And then, of those three grams of fat, just one gram is saturated, which means that we've only got 6% of the calories that are actually coming from fat, which is really terrific, and especially around, you know, Thanksgiving time, that sort of thing. Okay, cholesterol is down to 33, and then sodium at 7, and 
virtually, you know, um, I don't have numbers <laughs> today for fibre. Well, that's because I had cereal for breakfast. Um, so, that, uh, those are very good numbers. Now, all it really takes is to actually see what it looks like when you carve into it. And actually, as the family carve into it, they can eat it like a pie. You cut a wedge of it, and there's the, the hot, steaming, well, you know. Uh, mm. And the ham, that's like salt in it. And the turkey. And the potatoes with the buttermilk under there, just that touch of nutmeg in it. And that sauce goes so well with it, it's just wonderful. All right? So I really hope that you enjoy it, have a wonderful time. Don't forget, minimize the risks in things, maximize the flavor, and I'll be back with you next week. God bless. Bye. Kez Kitchen. It's really two programs in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a program about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colorful. Maximize the flavor. Okay, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimize the risk. So welcome to Graham Care's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. Well, welcome again. This time, of course, we're going to have another look at those things where we minimize risk for you and at the same time boost the flavor because you can't do the one without the other. If you take risk out of something and don't fix it up, what it is, it's dull and terminally bad news. So that's what we're trying to do. I'll do a little simple thing first and then just expand it a little bit for you. What we call springboarding so that you can actually see the things that I do and think, ah, neat idea. I can bounce on that idea of his and do my own thing. That's what I'd really love to happen, if you would. All right, um, first things then, let's have a look at this. Um, creamy toppings. Now, almost everywhere that you go, I mean, um, you could have a slice of pie, or you could have, let's say, a muffin, like this. Uh, almost everywhere, say, look, um, here's, here's a typical one here. <laughs> What's that? I knew you potato, of course. Uh, what you do, you wind up, you put things, you say, somebody comes say, do you want it a la mode or with whipped cream? Yeah, well, fine, yes, of course. And uh, how about on your muffin in the morning, a good spread, perhaps? And what about in the potato in its jacket? Why not just put it? Do you know it's amazing wherever you go, there's a little bit more. Do you know that this could add up to 200 calories? And this one could add up to 85 calories? And this one, 95 calories? I mean, just one after another. So I thought it'd be pretty neat if I could actually get together with you and show you some of the ways of touching each one of these elements, but with less fat in it. Would that be all right? Okay, come, I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> Well, it all has one basic root cause to the whole thing, or, you know, foundation of the whole thing. And that is something which is now called, 
yogurt cheese or fresh cheese. I don't know if you've heard of that. But what it is, is you nick out to the store and you get a yogurt where, and you read the label, let's say, and it has absolutely no fat in it at all. It's not low fat, it's no fat. And it has no gelatin or anything else to be able to secure it and make it look, uh, you know, bouncy and firm. Now, this has got to actually come apart in the process of straining. So what you do is you get a little strainer like this one. So it's got a very fine gauze in it, and it's held together quite firmly so that it can go through a dishwasher. And just put it over the top of a jug or some bowl or, or even back in here if you want to. And then just take the... Um, this is perfectly plain. It has no flavor in it, therefore no sugar in it just completely plain yogurt. And just fill that up. Now, this particular strainer will take a full cup. In fact, if I just keep on doing that, I can actually get just about two cups out of it. Now, what happens when it strains, and you should just about be able to see it start now. You see how it's weeping here? You get 50% of the volume of that will be lost will go down into the bottom, and what's in the bottom is called whey, W-H-E-Y, and it's a sort of greeny kind of liquid, and uh, it's got protein in it, so you could use it in a bean dish or something like that, and uh, it doesn't taste that great, but it doesn't taste that bad either, but anyway, but in the top, I'll show you what it looks like in a moment when it's done. Now, if you don't have one of those things, and you're saying to yourself, well, I don't have one of those things, by the way, put a lid on the top of it always to make sure that nothing odd drips into the top of it. You could get one of these, which is a, a, just an ordinary strainer, a uh, plastic one will do, and just one sheet of kitchen... Um, what, I, you know, I never know quite what to call that, absorbent paper, you know what I mean, it's just sort of picker-upper stuff. And just drop the rest of that, just put it into there, it, it'll work just as well, and it will drain out. Now put a plate over the top. All right, stick it in the fridge, all right? And when you stuck it in the fridge, it will be there for about five hours. Now, I've actually left it in the fridge. Gosh, how long have I left it? I don't know. I mean, I must have left it in 10, 12, 15 hours. It's not that it suddenly spoils or goes wrong at all. All right. So, bearing that in mind that uh, we're going to get that, I'll show you what it looks like when it's strained in just a sec. Now, here, when I'm doing a dessert topping, say for a piece of pie, then that what I love to do is take some fresh fruit that's in season at the time, at the present moment, um, raspberries, and if they're not in season, then like these, then you can actually get frozen ones. And uh, in the same sort of little stainless steel, so that you can put some weight behind it, some of the little strainers, you, if, if you really pushed on it, you'd go straight through the bottom. So just make sure, if you're ever going to buy one of these things, that you can press on it hard. So you press on it until there's only seed left behind, and I want about a quarter of a cup of pulp underneath. Now, I'd do that with apricots, any other kind of fruit that you really like. But this is nice because it's got nice tart, good, good color too. So then I take just a product, one of those, just one cup full of the, of the strained yogurt, and just drop that down into the raspberry puree. And it, it's that thick. You remember how it looked before? twice as thick as that, could be even thicker. And here, in this little shot glass, um, there is the most wonderful honey. Now, I, I love this stuff, it's fireweed honey. And if you've ever gone along, sort of, if you've ever taken a railway trip uh, out west or midwest, and alongside the banks in the summer, you'll see the fireweed. They're about three to five feet high, pink, you know, sort of, they start about here and they sort of go up to about, well, about this high and they've wonderful foraging ground for bees. And uh, they get in there and they love it. And it's usually where there's been a fire, that's why it's called fireweed. And, and it really, it, it's in groves of them and the bees get in there and it's fabulous taste, I really enjoy it. So, there we go. Um, you stir that together and it, it's a liquid, it's like a heavy cream, all right? It makes a good dunking cream, really. So, just, um, Pour that out into a little cup and then serve that on the side. So that, that's the first one. It tastes great. I'm going to taste it a little later on. Okay. Now, next one. Next one is an intriguing thing because this is with fresh herbs. And so what I've got here is the, the actual stalk of chive, which of course is all stalk, and also the stalk of parsley. You see how that is? Not the top of parsley, but the stalks, well washed and cleaned, and then chopped up, and they had the most magnificent texture to them. 
All right? So those are the two textures of the two herbs. And then same amount, one cup and that you've strained off. And th this keeps quite well in the fridge. Now, it's about an eighth of a teaspoonful of black pepper in there. And just a, a short slurp of, <laughs> what's that, Graham? Teaspoonful of maple syrup. Maple syrup, if, uh, you know, um, this uh, yogurt has bright points like that. It goes ee, ee, like this, to the flavor. Um, and when you get maple syrup, it rounds off that little sharp bit. You won't, it doesn't taste sweet, but it's a wonderful idea. Okay, um, that, that's enough. Uh, then, um, just <laughs> put the herbs in, of course. Uh, the, the two herbs, crisp green, and then mix that together. Now, if you've had a baked potato in its jacket, and somebody comes, sour cream, you know, bacon chips, and uh, all, all the rest of the bit, just forget the bacon, and just think of this um, as a potato dish. So you take a potato, and just make a little cross on the top of that. If you like, and it's hot, you can wrap it around with a cloth like this, <laughs> and bring it straight out of the oven, and then press it around the outside. And it, it opens that up in the top, and it makes it the most wonderful thing to eat, actually, because it's sort of, it's ready for the topping. So the topping goes on there. Can you imagine what that's like? And there's no fat in that whatsoever. Remember, non-fat. Okay, put a muffin in, um, into a toaster. There we are, get it nice and hot. Let's put that on one side over there. All right, <laughs> I can't remember which ones it goes on, but it's all right. That's the herb one. Now, this one is just an absolute knockout. If you take garlic and you just simply cut the garlic off, the shoulders of garlic, like that, you've got this opened wide. Now, you can use the same bits, so you don't waste anything. And then wrap that up, put it in an oven at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 190 degrees centigrade. Just whack it on and ho! Oh. <laughs> Good. And um, it's somewhat hot. And, uh, and just unwrap it, and look, look, this gorgeous piece of garlic is just lying there, waiting to be used. <laughs> um, just press it down hard like that, and look, at, look what happens. It squeezes out into this fine pulp. Look, and that does not, I know, I can almost hear intake of breath. Come on, Graham, you're joking. I'm going to smell from here to kingdom come. Not at all. This has the most incredibly light texture to it and, and taste. So you just take that, which is about two tablespoons full of garlic pulp, and just whack that into, there we go, into the top. And another little spoon. I've got spoons all over the place here. And some freshly ground pepper as well. And do you know, here's where I'd like you to experiment. You see, I've got a whole bunch of fresh herbs here. I've got marjoram and thyme and all that sort of stuff. Well, here I've got just a little bit of thyme and just a little bit of marjoram. Just a, just a bit. Now, now, please do it just the way that you want to do that. All right? just, just your way of doing it. So just stir that up together. And, and please yourself, please do something that you really like the sound of. And then just shoot that into the top. Now this would be, I would say, with French bread. All right? Instead of butter at the table or rolls or something like that. Remember, always no fat whatsoever. Terrific stuff. All right, so we've got this one. I've got this and that one. And now, up here, come on. <laughs> I know, don't ever poke a knife into one of these things. That's entirely right. Now, I just want to show you what happens to this. Here is just a little bit of the absolutely plain yogurt put into a little tub. And I put this on my table for breakfast in the morning. I smooth it out and then another spoon, uh, just a little drop of marmalade on the top, and that's English Seville marmalade, and smooth that out. I cannot adequately describe to you how much I enjoy that 
when it's done. It's wonderful. A little bit of the garlic one, I want to put that on here so as to be able to taste it. <laughs> and a little bit of the, of the strawberry bit too. I, I want to taste each one with you. All right, okay. So there's the muffins. Here's the rest of the mix. Have I got something that's missing, Graham? Yes, of course I have. It's that one. Fine. <laughs> Presentation is everything. So I knew I'd have a good go at this one. There we are. I, I promised that there would be things for you when for toppings, for pies and muffins and potato. And so we've done it all. Let's have a look and see the sweet one here that we've got and see what we turned up with. The sweet one, this little pink one here, that instead of 217 calories is 89. The fat is zero. Okay, remember that? Zero saturated fat. 4% of that topping, therefore on a piece of pie, is fat. And only one milligram of cholesterol, 36 of sodium, and three dietary fiber. So that's terrific stuff. Now, here is the one which is a savory one, all right? That's the one with all the fresh herbs in it. And the same one for the garlic. Instead of 89 with the sour cream topping, you'd have 31. Zero again fat, zero saturated fat. Isn't this fun? 3%, only 3% calories from fat. Cholesterol one, 36 milligrams of sodium and dietary fiber, zero. <laughs> Okie doke. Now, quick bite. Mm. Every morning, the best time of my whole day is that combination. It's just superb. Mmm, raspberry. Good. And now this, which shouldn't be following the raspberry. Oh, that's such a good idea. All right. Now, just think of that. That really works well. And don't forget to springboard your idea. Okay. Now, my springboard on this one is going to be a pear dish. It's a dessert. So we'll look at the famous pear, Belle Helene, and then see what we can do to create a pear fondue. Huh? Dipping in some of this. All right. I'll show you how it's done. Good. Well, that, that is such a lovely taste. It's fresh, you know. And after a while, I mean, you will probably miss the butter in the beginning, but um, after a while, it's amazing how you get adjusted to it and how you enjoy it. Look, um, and several years ago, uh, Trina and I, this is a very green pear, by the way. This is a Bartlett pear, and it's a cooking pear, so um, if, if that sort of makes any difference, and it should be a cooking pear. It doesn't need to be one of those very ripe commis pears. So several years ago, Trina and I went to the Elio Cabala, um, out of Rome. It's um, at a little place called Frascati, which is well known for its uh, wines. And it's up in one of the, um, the mountains, sort of looking back over Rome. Gorgeous spot. And uh, we had a pear peeled for us by the most charming, Ita aren't they charming? Um, uh, it Italian waiter. And he did all of this with a silver, uh, a about 400 year old silver knife and a little fork at the end. And, um, and he, he just kept on talking to us and said, well, signor, you see you. And it was so good. And there was a, the sun was out and the sort of La Dolce Vita people hang around. And there was, the, there was a marble swimming pool. I mean, the whole thing was marble. And busts of Caesar, which looked as if they were real. Yeah. I mean, not real people, but I mean, you know, real old busts. So, anyway, so uh, he peeled it like this. It was, very, it was very attractive because he didn't touch it with his hands at all and then just got down there like that and, um, and proceeded to take all the pits out. And I, I didn't think of it at the time because I was sort of so overwhelmed by the dexterity of the whole thing. It was about twice as dexterous as this, maybe four times. And, um, <laughs> and it, but it occurred to me now, isn't there a lot of trim in a piece of fruit like this. And that, wouldn't it be great if you could actually do something with it? So I, I got to thinking about that. I thought, well, here, how about this idea? I'm put the, the over there. This is all the trim from just one pair. But if I just put that with, the, with another three pairs, I've got a lot of trim. So, and it's got lots of flavor in it. It's got bags of flavor in it. So I thought, well, look, I put some cloves in it because I love the flavor of cloves with pear, and then some cinnamon as well. 
and maybe half a cup of brown sugar, just to be able to sort of get some sweetness into it. So, why don't we just do that? Um, um, shove all... Of, no, no, not those. <laughs> I want to cook those later. <laughs> Nearly tricked myself. Um, so, uh, there, uh, all the peel went into the top, and then the, a piece, you know, the cinnamon and the cloves, and then the brown sugar. All right. And then two and a half cups. Come on, Charlie. Good. Two and, two and, this is in order to save wasting water. Um, two and a half quarts um, of water, just about, all right? And put it on the heat and just turn the heat up and, and simmer it then. Right. So you simmer it to extract the flavor from it. So when, when you've actually finished, it looks as tired as that does. Now, that is extracted. I mean, there's just nothing left in that at all. But what is left behind is spicy. Now, then I simply raised the heat underneath this and boiled that down until it became just one, pie, no, just one cup of shining innocence like this. Now, that is, if you roll it around, it almost leaves like a liqueur, sort of kind of bathing on the side of the dish. It's just gorgeous, the smell of it. It's slightly spiced, but the perfume of the pear is just great. All right. So then take, then, you see, after you've done that, before you, you, you boil it down, um, you, you put uh, the pears in there. Do, do you understand that? I mean, I got, I got ahead of myself. But you put the pears in, and then you cook the pears for half an hour. Right? Then you reduce the stock by half. Now, because the pear juice is in there as well as the trimming, I mean, you've got it absolutely. So that's when it looks like that. Right. <clears throat> so you've got one cup, and just pour it into a small saucepan and raise the heat underneath it so as to get it nicely, beautifully, wonderfully hot. And um, I've got a tablespoonful of arrowroot. I think you know me by now. I'd love to use pure starch and things. And um, about two tablespoons full of water. And that um, just rustled together makes the perfect glaze. Now, you could use cornstarch, but if you did that, what you'd have was this cloudiness which comes over the top. I don't want to get cloudiness. So that's done. All right. Now, after it's been in there, after these things have been simmering away for just half an hour, you, they come out, and I'm going to put it on this plate because I saw it earlier on in that plate. Look at that. There are some beautiful things in this world, and you may be sitting at home and saying to yourself, really, Graham, you're waxing too eloquent about this one, but I cannot wax over eloquent about this one. This is gorgeous. That has just a, a vaguest little spice in it like that. I can put the knife blade in, it sinks into it, and it's perfect. Right? Now, what I want to do is I want to create a, um, a fondue. Remember the old thing that you have in the garage which you haven't used for years? And you can get it out so that you, know, you poke a, a stick in something and then dip it somewhere? Well, I'm going to dip it into that yogurt that I made with the, with the fresh raspberries, you know, the frozen raspberries in there and thought to myself, if I dip that into that rice, what a combination. All right. So I cut all of those up, looks like this. This is just coming to the boil now. So take, the, take this, this um, arrow root, move it to the side, never over the heat, stir it in, and then the moment you've stirred it in, you can get it back on the heat again, just to be able to clear and come to the top. OK, let's get the one in the fridge whilst that's happening. <laughs> they look so wonderful. Look, look, look at that glaze over the top. Everything glistens and it looks perfect. So, oh, and about this stage, it takes that amount of time to be able to thicken up and to be perfectly ready. Now, I took these pears and then dropped this glaze on the top of them. Look, look at the glaze. Look at the glaze. And there, you can serve it hot if you like, but I really would prefer that that went into the fridge and got cold, just like these that have just come out. All right, and then a spoonful onto the plate. And because I was looking for something that was absolutely elegant, without any question of doubt, very simple indeed, leave it like that. And then put this onto the side, and then I'll show you how this actually eats together. Turn the heat off, save money. Come through and I'll show you how it, it compares, actually, with the classic dish 
of all times, perhaps the Père Belle Helene. But first of all, here at this video, you would lay the little fondue fork on the side with this and then put this dunking liquid there, have your party guess all the way around it, perhaps make double the quantity, and then you'd be into it. Now, this is the Père Belle Helene, which is just hot chocolate sauce, ice cream, whipped cream, and poached pears on the top. <laughs> down, down. All right. Now, let me show you the difference, if you'd like to see that there's a real difference here. Okay, um, 708 calories drops down to 224. And then fat, 25 um, grams of fat here, one gram of fat. Now, this is for dessert time, you guys. Saturated fat, absolutely zero. That means the percentage of the calories that are actually giving come from fat, whereas 32 here, are only 4% in this dish, which is fun. Cholesterol, which used to be 59, it's not too bad really, is down to only one, which is good, of course. Sodium is just 54, so it's no real problem there. Dietary fiber is up to six, which is excellent. I couldn't think of a more intriguing way of having a dinner, dinner party that for friends that I loved, that I wanted to look after, and who would actually leave my home and go away and say to each other, not we're going to have to run 3,000 miles to get that dinner off. But to think, wasn't that a wonderful dinner? And let's try that fondue, because it was such a good idea. Hmm. I'm just trying to imagine the kind of food that I would serve first, the tartness, the, the, the flavor of the, of the yogurt is just coming through. But the raspberry just peeks over the top of the yogurt and swims around that pear, which is just tender in the mouth. Spicy. All right? Nice idea. Thanks so much for being with me once again. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next time. Great stuff. Bye. Kitchen. It's really two programs in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a program about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colorful. Maximize the flavor. OK, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimize the risk. So welcome to Graham Care's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. <laughs> well, welcome back once again. This uh, program today is really about stocks and broths and things like that. It's a, it's a foundation if we're going to cook great food. You know, normally what I do is do a technique, just one, and then springboard into something a little bit more. This time it's all technique, wall to wall. Got four different things for you. Come through. Actually, what I'm going to do is, is try and explain the difference between a stock, broth, and water, I guess. Um, I found out that uh, when you take the fat out of something and the salt out of something and the sugar out of something, uh, it can be horridly bland and it really needs all the aroma, color and texture you can master to get into that. And one of the ways of doing that is to look at whether water will do it. Well, when water has got, you know, this fat fellow in here and he's got his hands out either side bracing and doesn't want to sort of leave it for a moment, it works you can actually put water into a dish and the fat will carry the flavor. But when we've actually gone to the process of banning uh, fat from the thing, you do need to have 
this remarkable substance called a stock or a broth. Now, the big A is what I want to try and make the point. It's got to be aromatic. Every single thing that you can do to make that liquid aromatic is important. And so today we're going to look at four different ways to make water aromatic. Ready? Come on, let's go. Great. Well, now, um, as you see, I've got pots everywhere. It's, it, it'd be good fun, this one. Just one teaspoonful of oil in the bottom of a large pot. I don't know what kind of large pot you've got, but you need to have a large pot, something which is going to hold about 12 pints, at least, in order to be able to make uh, a decent stock. All right. Um, now, into this, uh, in all stocks that I do uh, have got onions in them. Onions are a fantastic thing to add. And for once, you don't have to fiddle around with the onion. All you've got to do is just hack it up so that there are sort of large pieces. But this is an important part. In everything that you do with this whole process of producing aroma, is there are natural volatile oils in the onion, and that, um, you know, oil is there, the little bit of sesame in it as well, the olive oil. And now the, the, the air is coming up, and it's filled with aroma. You've got to fry it first, and the ingredients have... Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say got to, but, you know, I feel that you really should. The ingredients should be not tired old pieces of celery, but everything should be fresh and wonderful. It's not, um, you know, a stop-off point on the way to the garbage, uh, a stock. The, in, in this, you need everything as good as it can be. Uh, because it really, when you think about it, it's going to get underneath the flavor of other things, and you want to give the other food, which is very expensive usually, all the help that it can get. Good. So that's frying away nicely there. Now, um, there are, in order to help the aromatic side of it, there are always things like bay leaves. This is bay leaf from the laurel bush and loris noblis. And this is here some couple of sprigs of fresh thyme. Could use dried thyme. It happens to be one of the herbs that go well when it's dried. Parsley, I prefer fresh, and it's usually available all year round. And then a few black peppercorns and a couple of cloves. Those cloves, it, you'd probably think, gosh, they're not going to go any distance at all. But they really do. They're wonderful things. They get a wonderful aroma going. Um, you don't have to put it in a mesh ball or anything else like that. Just chuck it straight in. Because, after all, everything's going to be strained off and thrown out anyway. Okay. So, there it is. All jumbled around. It doesn't take a long time, by the way, this sort of thing. It just seems to be because it takes, you know, the couple of hours. All right? Um, now, this is an eight-cup container. Right? This is what we call the latte container for Seattle. This is about the standard that most people are involved in. Okay, now, just put that in onto the top. And now you've got to decide for yourself what kind of basic flavor you're going to have. Right? Now, if it's chicken, and I, this one is chicken, uh, may I suggest to you that you get a three-and-a-half-pound bird and then just simply take off the pieces that are just really full of bones and could do a better job. I mean, you could pick over this, but you're going to eat a lot of skin at the same time. So take that off and take the, you know, the whole back and the ribs and the breastbone area until you're left just with the primary cuts. So it doesn't take a moment to be able to cut it up. And look what you've got. You've got a much less costly, uh, you know, breast of chicken could be 15 cents a pound less. And all of this is just bunts. It's, it's an old family word that used to have bunts. Um, it just means it's over and above anything that you thought you were going to have. All right? Lid on, um, that, that lid off, um, and just let it simmer like this. Now, two hours simmer if you want a broth or a soup base of some kind. Four hours simmer if you're going to make a sauce out of it. So all you need to do is just walk away. Well, almost. As it's happening, Take a skimmer like this one and just run the skimmer over the top and collect some of the fat and the, dare I say, well, I call it froth. <laughs> it can be, you know, despumation um, or scum, if you will, <laughs> that comes off the top there. Just um, put it in and what I do, I put it into a fat strainer. See this? 
um, the fat comes to the top and all the debris kind of uh, falls to the bottom and you've got clear stock in between. I'll show you how you fix that in just a moment. But that's what I do all the time, just keep on walking past it. It doesn't matter. It's out of sight, out of mind. It only took five minutes to start the thing going. All right, good. Now, here's another type of, of um, stock. If, if you want to, say if you're doing some beans or some uh, uh, brown rice or something like that, you know how turgid those things can be when they've been, um, you know, no real flavor to it. It's just water in brown rice. Have you ever had that? And if you like it, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cast any expressions about it. Um, put it into some cold water, bring it up to the boil in the saucepan, and then go back to this again. I, I do that just to blanch the outside of the thing, because I really don't know what it's been. And when it's been in a heavy smoke, it could be all kinds of stuff on the outside. Anyway, put that uh, back into the pot, and, uh, come on, thank you, uh, and just run enough water over the top of it. It's about five or six uh, pints of water normally. Uh, should just about cover it. And check the manufacturer's handbook if you're going to be using a pressure cooker like this one. And this is a pressure cooker idea. By the way, um, if you want to use beef bones, okay, then beef bones are put in the oven about 350 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour. And um, <laughs> I just opened it up and got it all in place. And, um, and see how beautifully brown they are? Now, that gives you color as well as a great flavor, all right? And also the fat just comes falling out of it. All right, then a couple of bay leaves, all right, on top of that, and three cloves, just a couple of cloves up on the other ones. It's amazing how much that does in terms of real flavor. Then, always check manufacturing, you know, always check this thing. Ah, I can see you. This is a hole through here, and you've got to make sure that a hole in a pressure cooker is open uh, before you start. That's the, the main thing. It doesn't matter how modern the device is, that has got to happen if you're going to be safe with it. Um, put the little lid on, build the heat up. When it starts to sis, you know, like this, then's the time to turn the heat down.